today discussing uh, product design and looking at ways in which products can help resolve some of the behavioral uh, constraints uh, that we see in, in, in appropriate financial management. Um, today, after the microcredit impact uh, and interest rates panel that we just had, we're going back to that kind of discussion and introducing uh, two studies that, that illustrate um, two more of these barriers. Uh, one is going to be attention, and that's the study that Maggie is going to talk about. And the other one is going to be, it's, it's fairly linked, uh, it's inertia or uh, the tendency uh, that people have at, um, at um, continuing to do what they were doing before without being able to change, overestimate their ability to change their behavior. Um, in short, we call this defaults. Um, and this is the one thing that is, explains the difference between the green columns here and the red columns here in terms of performance in organ donations. Um, the countries on the right, the red ones, have very low rates of um, voluntary organ donors. And the ones on the, in green have very high rates of organ donors. And the only difference is the default option that people were offered to give. It's the difference between opting in and opting out of the organ donation decision. So this is, uh, as I was saying, part of the planning fallacy, right? So is despite the intention that people, despite the best intentions, people might just be underestimating how difficult it is to change behavior. And um, this is what we call, using other words, status quo bias or inertia. So people tend to be irrational and uh, stick with what they were doing before. Um, today is the best predictor of, of the uh, behavior in the future. The, the study, before I get into the study that I'm going to present, which is not, um, I work for Innovation Supporting Action, so I'm not one of the authors of that study, um, but it was presented, and I should have probably spent some time giving you the names of the authors, by Felipe Barrera, Marianne Bertrand, Lee Linden, and Francisco Perez. It's, it's a seminal study in this field, I think, in terms of uh, explaining um, the power of defaults uh, on behavior. I think this would be the other choice uh, that we would have used to, to explain this concept. This is another study, an example on how uh, vouchers for fertilizers in Kenya, if timed right, can have the same effect as a 50% subsidy on the price for these fertilizers. So what they did in this particular study is offering a time of harvest when uh, farmers are, are liquid, they have a lot of, you know, they have cash, offering them the opportunity of, of binding their cash into vouchers that, for fertilizers that they would pick up uh, at the time of, of planting. Um, so as you can see, adding this particular voucher and, and, and allowing people to, um, and, and at this particular time is, is the one difference that, um, you know, that, that shows the difference in behavior between a 28% usage of fertilizer and a 38% usage of fertilizer. It's pretty significant. Okay, so these are what we call nudges. Some of you might have read a book that had an elephant on the cover similar to this one. It's called Nudge. Uh, I looked for a long time at the translation in Spanish. The only thing I could find is pequeños empujos. Uh, it just doesn't <laughs> do the same. Um, but, you know, to avoid also confusions in translations, this is what it is. Um, so it's, it's, again, the idea of changing, of offering, offering or actually choosing a default today to modify the behavior of tomorrow, starting from the idea that we tend to be, um, you know, t we, that we can actually take advantage of, of the fact that we're a little bit lazy at changing, at changing our decisions, take advantage of this inertia. Why is this relevant for financial services? Um, well, the, the short answer is 401k plans in the U.S. are a great demonstration of, of how defaults are uh, an effective way, of, um, an effective way of, of making us save more uh, without noticing. We don't notice that the money is moving away from our account 
uh, on a regular basis. And, and in particular, there's the study, uh, which is now almost, which is almost 10 years old now, uh, on automatic enrollment of 401ks that shows how uh, um, much higher the take up uh, of, of these um, essentially commitment savings accounts to come back to, to the concepts that uh, Dean presented yesterday um, was done much higher uh, by creating an automatic enrollment. Again, the default option is you are going to save, you can opt out. Now, it's an interesting thing about, um, about the, the default it can go both ways, and, and this study is, 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 is explaining it very nicely. Um, yes, the take-up is much higher uh, if you create an automatic enrollment, so if you essentially you make the default op option to take on the savings account. Um, but you also have a, a problem which you might actually anchor the people to a minimum common denominator, so uh, to the uh, baseline um, uh, adoption rate of, of the 401k. So let's say the contribution is 3%, and most people actually tend to stick to the 3% contribution rate that you gave them as a default, uh, while uh, if you compare those to the ones that actually took the active decision of taking these accounts, uh, the, the savings rate are normally much, much higher. So, you know, more take up, but probably lower, lower intensity. And for your curiosity, in case you don't know yet, this other study, also quite old, uh, but really, really interesting, um, it was, was testing a product that is, is essentially trying to uh, make people uh, resolve this problem of anchoring the effects of defaults uh, by, by setting up um, uh, an automatic increase of um, con pension contributions when you don't notice. So when you get a salary raise, when, you, when your salary increases, you're essentially uh, already putting, you know, today you're planning that for your future raises, a higher percentage of your raise and of your salary will go into pension. So the impact on your cash and on everyday life, it's, it's unnoticeable. You are still getting a raise. You just don't notice that you're putting also more money into, into your savings account. So a uh, very interesting study and, and, and quite successful in the US. We do not have a lot of evidence in a uh, developing country of, of this mechanism working. And this is why we have to uh, go almost into what some other colleagues would actually define an education study more than a financial inclusion. Uh, study to, to, to prove our point. Um, this is, you know, halfway in between. Um, the study that I'm looking at presenting right now is, uh, is a conditional cash transfer study, uh, and um, it's looking at, again, the product design of this conditional cash transfer. So are we, um, this is um, in, in Bogota, this is the, um, it's Subsidio Educativo, so it's, it's essentially, um, an attendance incentive for ki uh, children, actually, and youth in, in Bogota to, to attend school and maintain a minimum of 80% of uh, attendance rate uh, on a monthly basis. Um, what we do is conditional cash transfers have been used before quite a bit in terms of um, a mechanism to improve enrollment. What, what the authors here are looking at, uh, sorry, attendance, uh, what the authors are also looking at is um, improving the enrollment aspect. So uh, they did notice that at a certain point, especially between middle and high school, middle school and high school, uh, kids would drop out of school. And it seemed that the conditional cash transfer wasn't very equipped to, um, to help improve that indicator. So in 2005 and 2006, uh, they tested uh, some variations on, on, on the way they were uh, giving this uh, essentially tran this transfer, this money. So this is just a quick background on, on Colombia. I'm going to skip through most of it. Um, just one thing to notice is um, this study focuses on the two lower levels of the CISPIN, which is essentially the poverty uh, index, poverty strata of, um, of Colombia. So we're looking at the poorer um, set of the population. And, and, and as you can see in the last, po in the last point down here, uh, the bottom two levels of CISPIN have um, you know, have considerable dropouts between middle and, um, well, basic secondary and middle secondary school. Okay, so three different types of conditional cash transfers. The first one is a basic conditional cash transfer, so it's what we all know. Uh, the beneficiary is getting $15, 30,000 pesos, conditional on respecting an attendance of 
80% of, of classes of days in a month. Um, simple, pure incentive on attendance. Second design, same incentive on attendance, only there's a default. You're getting a liquidity of 20,000 pesos, so $10, and one third of your transfer is actually saved for you, put in an account that will become liquid only at the time of paying for next year's school fees in December. <laughs> so same incentive, only we're creating the default of pushing some of the money to when you need it the most. This is exactly the same process as the fertilizer in a way, right? So it's giving you liquidity when you really need to, to make the purchase. Uh, and the theory here is that it's not the short term um, you know, availability of, of cash that is, is the constraint to attendance, but it might be that the long-term savings constraints are actually what, what really matter. And that the long-term savings constraints are also what determine this lack of uh, improvement in terms of the enrollment in school. Third variation is, is possibly even more interesting, I would say. Uh, it's, it's looking at um, a smaller incentive to attendance. So what we're comparing here is, 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 is actually looking at providing a smaller incentive. Before it was 30,000 pesos, now it's 20,000 pesos a month uh, to look at the ability, uh, sorry, what the impact of this incentive is on attendance. And then we're looking at a large incentive, which is actually independent from uh, your performance in terms of attendance um, for graduation and, immatric uh, and matriculation to tertiary schooling. So this is essentially, if you finish high school, we're going to give you a, a whole lot of money, 600,000 pesos, which is about, you know, it's 75% about of, of what the school fees for uh, a vocational school might be um, right after, you know, right after um, high school. And, um, but it, it will come only at once. And again, it has the same issue of essentially resolving the lack of the the lump sum is, is the difficulty that we have in, a, in creating lump sums for investments that we plan to make, but when it's the time to make them, uh, we, we're normally uh, cash constrained. Okay, so this is just a summary. And I just wanted to add this slide to show how um, these three designs are actually equivalent from a point of view of the financial institution and a point of view of the beneficiary. There's, there's the same amount of money that you're getting you're giving out or you're receiving. Uh, and as soon as I'm saying this, I'm telling you that I'm actually lying. And that's because uh, in this particular, for, for the point of view of the study, because this particular study is actually done only over one year, while the third incentive, the one that is giving you a whole lot of money to graduate from high school, so to, to move from high school to, to vocational school, um, would be equivalent only um, if, if considered over a span of six years. So. This will become clear why I'm underlining this when we're actually looking at the results. OK, so quickly. Um, the study publicly advertised radio. Um, people had to register at, um, with, with their parents to, to, be able, to be eligible to be essentially uh, participating in this, in this pilot. Um, and, and they had to meet some, some conditions that are fairly basic to, to be in. Uh, the study recruited about 13,000 students and the randomization was at the individual level, so uh, we had a fairly precise um, estimation here. Um, the caveat is that, unfortunately, uh, because of logistical um, you know, issues, um, the, 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 the study is actually divided in two separate randomized evaluations, which means that the graduation treatment, the third piece, the, the one with the big lump sum at the end of, of high school, is not going to be comparable with uh, the other two treatments. It's going to be, um, at least not strictly. OK, so the first experiment is looking at one group with control, so there's no cash transfer. One group that is giving the normal cash, cash transfer as the more traditional one, just liquidity on a monthly basis. And uh, the third group is, is essentially postponing some of this liquidity to the point in which you have to pay for school fees. The second experiment is just comparing the graduation conditional cash transfer, so the one that is giving the big lump sum at the end of high school, with the control group. Here are the results on one of the 
three sets of outcomes that we're going to look at today. Um, attendance. So as you can see, um, the, con the cash transfer actually works. Um, so the, the CCT, which is the second column, the one with the label standard, is effectively increasing uh, attendance in schools. Um, what is interesting is that the two variations on this original design that somebody, you know, if, if, the, if the theory that short-term um, short cash liquidity is, is what determines attendance was true, uh, we would expect to, be, to have essentially a lower impact on attendance, uh, still, still defend themselves. And they're almost exactly at the same level as, as, um, as the basic cash transfer. So a smaller, the takeaway from this slide is, is a smaller um, incentive to, um, to, to attend on a, on a regular basis. So a smaller monthly transfer is, is, is not really uh, determining a change in behavior. Um, well, here is some heterogeneity stuff. So it's, it's actually looking at subgroups. Um, interestingly, the, the impacts here are mostly focused on boys. Uh, girls uh, don't have any significant impact on, on attendance, uh, but they were starting at a higher level. So essentially, uh, boys are catching up. That's what um, this is. And the other, and, and we have seen this in a, previous, in, in a few of the studies that we looked at yesterday, um, there's the larger effects here are on the wealthier set of the poor children. Remember that we're still looking at children in CISPIN one and two, so in the to two lower strata of the, of the uh, social status in, in, in Colombia. Um, the other uh, interesting thing that, they, that the authors do is actually look at predict predictions of not being able to uh, attend. So they create a model based on, on demographics, on, on whether they would think that you would be less likely to attend, and, and find that you know, uh, these cash transfers are actually um, fairly successful at or most of the impact actually is concentrated on those that we would have imagined that would probably drop out the most. Sorry, uh, not attend the most. Right here. Okay, um, this is just to come back to Dean's point earlier today and Ashwarya's point yesterday. Self-reporting and administrative data or directly monitored uh, data uh, can, can give you very different answers. If this study was actually done only on self-reporting, uh, um, so, sorry, self-reported measurements, we would have found no impact. And there's a significant over-reporting on participation uh, by the kids when you ask them whether you went to school last week. Um, that's, you know, probably not surprising. Um, but the direct monitoring is a, in, that was done through essentially assistants going to the school and, and, and literally taking a, a list every day was, um, was the, the data that allows us to, do, to allow that, allowed us to make these conclusions. Okay, so here is the real, this is the meat in terms of the default aspect. So um, the variation in the design of the conditional cash transfer is aiming to make us, to make the kids essentially enroll more in the next year of school, right? And it's, it's pretty um, obvious how, how it works. So in case you haven't gotten accustomed to the, to the stars, uh, when it's three stars, it's really good. It's really precise. Uh, when it's one star, is is uh, a little less precise of an estimate. So it's uh, much harder. Uh, it, it, it's harder to say that that was a clear impact. Um, so in as you can see, the savings program is is increasing take up, uh, sorry, enrollment for the next year by by about uh, a little bit more than four percentage points uh, for the savings program, which is the third column here in green. Uh, and the graduation incentive is also, um, you know, being quite successful at, 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 at making kids move from one year to another uh, at almost the same way. Remember, though, that we cannot um, compare strictly the two studies. Okay, I'm going to skip on this um, because I want to make this point. Um, the tertiary enrollment, so this is essentially what the third design mechanism was focusing on, getting people from school to... Uh, vocational school is found to be quite effective. This, this graph is only referring to kids in, in the last year of high school. Uh, it seems to be quite effective in terms of pushing uh, kids from a 19%, which is the red column here, 
to uh, a 68% graduation level. It's, so essentially, there's 48 per percentage points. The kids are 48 percentage points more likely to finish high school and enroll in tertiary school. Um, I, the, the authors don't, you know, this is self-reported data, so that there's one, one uh, challenge with believing this indicator. Uh, the other piece uh, that you should keep in mind when interpreting this is that you should remember that these uh, children have received a 600, uh, you know, a, a $300 incentive just out of a one-year, uh, you know, attendance rate, essentially. Uh, to, to graduate. So this is not an equivalent incentive in terms of cash size uh, for the study. Okay, um, this is actually data that is in support of that effect. So we do find that always in self-reported stuff, the kids that, uh, these kids in, this, in the red column here that graduated um, much more likely because of the, of the third design uh, did uh, is um, also, they, they also essentially are um, declaring to have to, to study much more as the primary activity and to work and earn less in terms of work. So it seems to corroborate the idea that uh, the, the, the third design of the cash transfer, the one that was bringing the big lump sum at the end, is effective at, at uh, improving um, at improving the rate of kids that go to vocational school. I ran out of time. This is a very tricky slide, so I will skip it, but I am sure that Hector will probably ask about it. Um, okay, so what are the conclusions of this? Um, conditional cash transfers focused on a day-to-day -day cash flow uh, limitation are effective at resolving that, um, that particular obstacle to school attendance, uh, but defaults are also, you know, by, by doing a very simple variation on team and, and creating this default savings for the longer term is, is effective at removing the savings barrier that seems to be an obstacle for enrollment in the next year and perhaps also graduation to a uh, vocational school in the future. So it's very, you know, it's, it's, it shows the power of, of, um, of, of being able to commit at the beginning uh, and, and essentially making the change or the investment seamless in the sense that you're not noticing uh, when you're saving. And this is, I think, one of the big, you know, takeaway potentials of, of this um, particular tool. Um, the last point is um, conditional cash transfers, at least in this study, have highlighted some troubling pieces on, on in, uh, some troubling evidence on, on intra-household and sibling dynamics, uh, which uh, I'm happy to talk about, you know, separately at the coffee break if you want to have more information on it. Thank you.